Um, today, as we're going to develop APIs, I have three links for you. The first one is um, actually a repository on GitHub. Here's the link. Um, and this is what we're going to use throughout the, the lecture uh, and on the second part where there's the, there's the hands-on area. It basically is a repository of several public APIs, like maybe 200 APIs that you can make use of, that you can register for free um, and you know do stuff with. It has everything from weather data to Twitter to Reddit to Facebook or um, song lyrics, translations to running a country. The city of Helsinki has an API and you can basically follow how they decide to run their city. So uh, the municipality has an API for their hearings. You can see their meeting minutes. You can see their um, upcoming schedule for meetings. And basically, you can follow your city through an API. It's an open standard other cities are trying to follow. And there are, I guess, six more cities in the test phase for that. Um, Barcelona, Amsterdam, and several more. <laughs> but the idea is almost everything in the world is happening through APIs. Um, humans are a part of the internet traffic, but a significant portion of, of the traffic on the internet is basically automated API calls by robots, by you know, machines or applications that we write. So it's important for you to understand how you can interact with um, an API in JavaScript, in Node.js, and make use of it to do <coughs> to do some stuff. Let's first start by creating a repository. I hope this is um, not news to everybody. If you're here for the first time, uh, we tried to tell you what you needed for this workshop or for this lecture, Node.js uh, mostly, and an IDE that you can write JavaScript in. Um, it would be good if you had MongoDB, but we're not going to use MongoDB today to keep stuff a little bit simpler. Um, but I'm going to create a new directory and do npm init, which gives me um, a default Node.js project. I'm just typing enter for everything to accept the defaults. <coughs> what npm init does is it gives you a package JSON, a file that defines that that folder is a um, a JavaScript project and not JS project. And then I open it in my IDE. I have a shortcut for it called code. Um, you may have different means, but please definitely open it um, in your IDE. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new file, index.js, and I don't know, write console log, hello world. Now, this is kind of a recap of the previous year. But you need these skills. We were talking about debugging last year. Who's here uh, from the the first lecture series, like from last year? Um, five people, kind of. Yeah, five, six, maybe. All right. <coughs> so, debugging any application is an essential skill that your colleagues don't have. And if you can get good at debugging, regardless of your current skill level, whether you're a junior developer or a senior developer, you'll be a star in your teams. So it's always a good idea to be able to debug stuff. How do we um, do that in Visual Studio Code, which is our ID of choice? We have a debug menu here. I click that. Um, the first thing is I need to add a configuration. Here's the gear item for that. And yeah, 
and I click Node.js, I choose Node.js, and what it does is it gives me another file. I don't have to do anything with this, I can just close this because it already created that file for me. Okay, but then I go to debug menu again and I click run, and you see the output. Hello world here. So we'll be making use of debugging a lot during this session and you'll use it extensively while you're working with APIs because most of the time the documentations are not that um, straightforward so you don't quite understand what responses you will get from the APIs. It's always better to do it live and to see how the backend responds. <coughs> so it's always a good idea to start everything um, by knowing debugging and by debugging stuff. All right, the second thing was about making requests. So last year, again, we used some library called Axios to make uh, requests to our own backend, the backend that we developed. And Axios is again the library that we're gonna use um, on this course as well, on this lecture as well, to make calls to external APIs. Basically, it's a set of library functions in Node.js that enables you to make calls to um, other web, web pages, websites, web services, APIs, or um, whatever you like. So um, the IDE has a terminal built in, so you can run commands here, or you can go to your own terminal and run them here. Um, the command is npm install axios. Yeah. Here, let me write again. npm install axios. Who is following me with live coding? That's great. <coughs> Who has Axios installed? All right. Um, cool. So I'm going to use Axios to make some requests to, again, some web pages like google.com. Let's request Google's homepage and see what we get. First is I require Axios. Right? And who remembers the syntax for Axios? How do you make calls with it? Like, how do you fetch Google's homepage with Axios? Anybody? Raise your hands and tell me. No one? Come on, you're six people from the last lecture. No one? Uh, okay. Well, it's as simple as doing axios.get and you type the URL, google.com. Now, what this does is it gives you a promise. And again, following from last year, a promise is something, um, some operation that will result in the future. That's why it's called a promise. It promises to result whether successfully um, or it will result in an error, but it will result in the future. And that means we should act after it's resolved. You know, first it will resolve and then we will do something else. So the API is very straightforward. You say axios.get and then you do that then, <laughs> okay? And this basically gives you the response. This means uh, we'll pass in a function here, whatever function we pass will get parameters. That is the response of the query that we did, which is uh, getting the homepage of google.com. So this is the response and we map it to its data property because it has a lot of um, other properties inside like the header, the success code, the address and um, a bunch of other stuff as well. And the data is actually what we're interested in. The data is the value um, that is in response to our query. And for Google, it's 
basically the HTML of their homepage. And these things are chainable. So we follow up with another then. And do body console log body. Um, I can actually write these like this. Okay. F5 is the debug command. I run it and you see this is the home page of google.com it's very cryptic because you know they don't have a byte to spend if they can share one single byte off of this home page they will make billions so um it's why it's very compressed and you cannot really see a lot here. <coughs> All right, who followed me so far? That's great. Um, who coded with me, like wrote the code for this? Okay, um, then try to catch up. Oh yeah, by the way, for newcomers, if you need any help during these things as well, we have a lot of people here to help you today. So just raise your hand and one of my friends, one of the co-instructors will come over and help you to get started or, you know, to answer your questions. Um, that's a very good question. I don't know. There are some yeah. Stektose around. Is it called Stektose? Yeah. yeah, that's, I guess, the only German word that I know. <laughs> Okay, now, <coughs> um, again, from the students from last year, when we did asynchronous programming, we were talking about promises, um, and then first we talked about callbacks, then we talked about promises, and then there was a third thing. What was that? Yeah, async and await keywords which actually simplify what we write here. This is kind of convoluted, like all those dens, we actually don't need them. So it's a little bit of a struggle to have async await on your index page, but um, let's do that. First, we start by creating a function. I will call that function work because naming is hard and I don't have a better name. Um, like for 10 years, I'm calling my main function work. You can also call it main, like in, in other languages. So const main equals async. Actually, you don't need the function keyword there. And then you move your code inside like this. And does anybody remember what I need to do here to turn this into a async await style code? Await what? Okay, is that all? Okay, first, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna get a response from Google's homepage, right? Um, I should start by declaring that as a variable. So const res equals await axios that gets and then I can have console log res that body. So it's as simple as this. We remove the dens and it's just a simple um, console log now. Of course, previously we could also skip the the first then, 
Um, but this is the default way of doing stuff. All right, so let's run this again. Sorry? Um, yes, press.data.buddy, all right. So if I run this, you won't see anything on the debug console. Why? <coughs> Someone else? No. Yes. Say it loud. Yeah, I haven't executed main yet, so I have to execute main. And let's see if it's gonna work. Okay, it's not buddy, it's data, right? Yeah, so now our code is a little bit simpler. So um, I have a very, very small example. I want to learn my location from my API. Think that you're developing a web application, a backend application. So obviously people are connecting to your web server and you get their IP addresses, but you also want to know where they are from. Maybe you will use it in something called internationalization, which means you will set the language of the response according to where they are, or you'll do, I don't know, something else based on their location. And the goal here today is, um, let's say I want to display the weather condition there for, you know, wherever the user is connecting to my web server from. So let's say here is Berlin. I want to display the weather conditions for Berlin for, I don't know, for next week or something. Why? Because I'm going to deliver them a huge package and they have to, I don't know, come and claim it. And I want to make sure that it happens in good weather or, you know, the, the customers know what kind of weather they will face when, they, when I do the delivery of their order. So it's a good idea, you know, if I'm gonna deliver their order in, in five days, it's kind of a nice thing. I give them, you know, the weather for your delivery um, will be, I don't know, sunny or rainy. So let's prepare according to that. Um, let's say we're building an e-commerce application and we're selling, I don't know, scooters. And we expect the customers to drive their scooters on the day of their purchase. Right when we deliver the scooter, um, it should be nice weather so that as soon as they unpack their scooter, they start driving. If they get their scooters in rainy weather, it's kind of you know it's like a nice new product, a new toy, um, but you cannot use it until the weather is nice. So we tend to deliver when the weather is nice. Um, for that, we have to know the location of the customer. We could get it from their address, um, but it's a good idea to double check it with where they connect to our services from. So um, the first thing that I'm gonna do is, well, I look at these things and there are a lot of APIs here. I picked one for you. Um, <coughs> it's called ipapi.co. and basically tells you your IP address and gives you information um, about, this is not real data, gives you information about where you are, okay? Your latitude and longitude, your postal code and everything. So let's try that. Basically what this does is you find out the IP address and it tells you the actual real address for that IP address. And then I think of getting the city from there and feeding it to a weather API so that I fetch the weather conditions and I show it on my homepage. Make sense? Yeah. 
And I don't have to do any of these because these are all done for me. Like I don't have to know which IPs belong to which cities. It's already in the database and there's an API for that. There's an API for weather. So I will just make use of them. So let's start with ipapi.co. Um, I go to their developers page, okay? And they have a documentation, an API documentation. Let's open that. Okay. <laughs> so I guess we're all trying from the same IP. Okay. Um, there's already an example for Node.js. When I choose an IP. So, yeah, see, it already gives me the example code that I need to type to use this API. What it says is if you want to get information about, um, about an IP, you use this URL. Okay. This is the IP address. You pass in JSON as the format. And there's some Node.js magic. We won't have to do those because we're using Axios. And as a result, you get this JSON, which tells you the region, the city, the IP, the country, name of the country, latitude and longitude, you're being tracked, everybody knows where you are. That's why you should be using VPNs. Never go online without a VPN because basically people can track you. Um, you know, it knows your time zone, knows wh where that IP belongs to, what that IP belongs to. For example, 8888 is the um, Google DNS, so it belongs to Google. This knows a lot about you. Um, therefore, it's a good idea to use VPN always. All right. And so the part that I'm interested in is here. Let's make this work in Axios. I'm just going to replace this. Okay. And I'm going to put something called a breakpoint here on the ID. A breakpoint is basically a tool that gives you the ability to stop the execution of your program so that you can inspect it in real time. You can inspect the values in real time. Now, I run this in debug mode again, um, F5, and you see it stopped here. And the debug menu actually shows you the value of the variables. So <coughs> we have the response. We have response.data. And you see we have um, all the information about that IP. So response.data.city is where we're, we're interested in, right? So I rerun this here using that button. I restart it. And the debug console, when I run this application, the debug console will log um, Mountain View. All right, this is good, but this is not my IP, right? I, should, I want my IP, or let's say the IP of the, of the user. In this case, I want my IP. Um, what is the best way to find your IP? You can ask Google, as it knows everything. It also knows your IP address, of course. You can go to Safari and say, what is my IP address? And it will tell you. It will say, this is your public IP address. But we don't have this functionality on the back end, right? Um, now, there is another Node.js library that does this for us, of course, as for everything. So I do a Google search, get IP Node.js, um, or get public IP Node.js. There are a bunch of libraries like external IP or others.
this is how real developers do it. They use Google and npmjs.com, which is the package registry, and they find something and they just use that. All right, so the library that I'm gonna use is not external IP, but it's called public IP, which is a little bit simpler to use. So I do npm install public IP, and it will install that library for me. I will require that in my app. Now, I'm gonna get my public IP basically. Const IP equals public IP dot v4. IP has two versions, it's v4 or v6. v4 is the one that we generally use, but it's basically this and it returns us a promise, so we need to await that because it will resolve some web service and get my IP address, um, or you know hit the network layer and the Ethernet card and get my IP address. All right, then I use that IP address to do a dynamic call. Notice that I changed the code to backticks so that I can use variables and yeah so let me run this let's first stop here to see what the IP is to see if it's correct and then I'm gonna continue I execute this all right the IP let's see that's great we have the IP that was simple right there's a library for everything. So you don't really have to write much code. And then I go one more line and it gives me results, data, city, London. All right. So looks like the people here are using a VPN um, or a company network that's in London. So if you go and use your 3G network, it will definitely be different. But let's move on with this. Or if you try this at home, you'll probably get Berlin. Um, your IP will be from Berlin. You can also ask Google, where am I right now? And although Google doesn't know it, Google knows somebody who knows where you are. So it will show you a web page that shows you your location on the map. Um, but this is great. So we have the city, London, and we have the IP address and we can work with that. We also have the latitude and the longitude here. So we will make use of those um, call technology services. Yeah, we'll make use of those values. Um, well, look at this value. Isn't it like a privileged thing? Longitude, it's minus zero, nine, 0 0.09. It's like basically they're in Greenwich. Um, but anyway, so we're going to make use of this latitude and longitude information when we ask for better data. All right, I stopped the execution there. Now I want some APIs that can give me um, the weather data, and there is an API called Dark Sky. I think it's .NET. <coughs> yeah. So gives you weather information. But again, there's the developer's link. They say, Dark Sky API, the easiest, most advanced weather API on the web. That's great. And they let us try for free, which is great. Um, let's try for free and bombard their servers. Um, but it asks us to register. So please do so, register. It asks for an email, password, confirmation. It will send you an email and you'll have to click a link to complete your registration, much like you do with any other website. 
and then I'm already logged in so then you'll be able to access the documentation so unfortunately there is no real standard on how to do API documentation so everybody is just doing it randomly there are some standards that are not really standard so I don't know um, you never know what you'll see when you um, see an API and you also don't know how you will make use of all these APIs you just learn by reading or by playing with the values so here's the API there are some API calls it tells us about weather conditions pricing attribution the first 10,000 requests are free of charge I hope we don't go over that uh, well when you sign up you'll get your own uh, application so we'll never go um, over 1,000 API calls hopefully then there are some request types forecast requests and <coughs> And I guess the next one is historical data. So we can actually ask for historical um, weather forecasts or realities. I don't know what the forecasts become after, you know, after they happen, after they become a reality. Yeah, <laughs> or readings, weather readings. I don't know. Anyway, so finally we saw something. HTTPS API darksky.net forecast slash key um, slash latitude and longitude so what is this key and what is this latitude and longitude um, I'm now pretending that I didn't go over this documentation before and I'm looking for something called key because I didn't read anything related to key here search for key key required your dark sky secret key that's a big, big sentence. Your dark sky secret key. Your secret key must be kept secret. Thank you, Captain Obvious. Um, in particular, do not embed it in JavaScript source code that you transmit to clients, which means don't put it on your web page because anybody who has this key, the secret, can make API calls instead of you eating up your daily API limits, which means you'll have to pay more and more and you'll never be able to use your own API. So make sure you keep this um, key really secret. It's called secret for a reason. Uh, but you can definitely use it in your Node.js applications uh, because it happens on the backend. As long as you don't send this to the client, you're fine. All right, so then we learned what key is. Fortunately, we know what latitude and longitude is. Um, that means we can make use of this API. This is a very, very simple API. You pass the key, in the URL that is very interesting um, and you wouldn't believe me but it's as safe as passing it in a HTTP header or um, in a body so it's okay if you pass it in the URL as long as you're using HTTPS which secures the rest of the domain name so your API dark, <coughs> dark Skynet domain name will be public and readable by anybody who wants to mess with your connection, like the, um, the service provider or your Wi-Fi router, they will know where you wanna to connect to, but they will never know what URL you're connect connecting to. So this part will be encrypted if you're using HTTPS. So that's always um, the best security practice. If you're connecting to a web page over HTTP, all of your traffic is basically um, sniffable, let's say, people will be able to see it. So make sure you use HTTPS all the time, especially for APIs, um, definitely use HTTPS. If any stupid developer gives you an API over HTTP, make sure you reject and don't use it um, because it's not safe. Okay, so this is the URL, forecast, blah, blah, and latitude and longitude. Um, let's go back. So I have the latitude and longitude in rest.data, right? And I want the weather information for that. 
const better rest, better response, equals await axios.get the URL. Um, this is obviously not the API key. This is, you know, it's not even random. It's, you know, zero to nine and A, B, C, D, A, E, F. Um, but I'm gonna replace that. I first want to show you what happens if you pass in a wrong key. And I want to pass in latitude and longitude. So it was available under rest.data, rest.data.latitude, comma, rest.data.longitude. All right, this is the end of the URL. So, and let's keep this, but also log weather rest that data. I run this with F5 again. I got the IP. Um, I got the latitude and longitude here. Oh, it crashed. My application crashed. Request failed with status code 403. Anybody knows what 403 is for? You can guess, yeah. Yeah, uh, it's forbidden. So when you try to access some resource that you don't have access to, um, Web servers should respond with a status code of 403, which is, sorry, you are unauthorized. You cannot access this resource. <coughs> Why is this the case for us? Yeah, because the key is wrong. And hopefully if I correct the key, um, we'll get rid of this. So let's go back and <coughs> let's go to account settings. And it's not there. Where is the key? Hmm? In the console. Let's try that. There it is. Your secret key. Perfect. And let's go back and paste our original key. Now, in fact, my secret key is not secret anymore. You see it, it's also on the internet. Um, so, it's, you know, you can pawn me. But in that case, what I do is, right after this course, I'm gonna go to this page and click reset secret key. Resetting your secret key will break any software that uses your existing key. Perfect, that's what I want. It will break your um, malicious code. So I will get a new secret key and I will try, I'll continue using that. So it will be secret again. Of course, obviously this is again, <laughs> not secret, but you get the idea, right? All right, let's paste the key here and run it again. The debug console, all right, we have the IP, it ran this time, and you see the status is this time 200, and we have data. Let's first log the, log everything. So here we have currently, daily, flags, hourly, minutely, these are all weather conditions. Let's go to currently. Apparent temperature 51. Hmm. Partly cloudy day. That's an icon that you can use from their icon set to show the um, the weather in, in graphics. Summary: partly cloudy, temperature 51, time of the day, whatever. All right. This 51 definitely is not Celsius because we're supposed to be in London. 
um, this is Fahrenheit, and what we should do is we should convert this into Celsius, right? Let's see, let's go back to the API documentations. You know, why is this giving me something that only one country uses? Celsius, hmm, there's nothing called Celsius here. If I search for units, there was the US there, and then we have all the other units here. And, oh, this is the language. That's not units. Yeah, here, return weather conditions in the requested units. Units should be one of the following, auto, CA, UK2, US, or CI. Um, let's say auto, so that people who order scooters in the US will get in Fahrenheit, people who order scooters elsewhere in the world will normally get Celsius, like normal humans do. So how do we make use of that? We add something at the end of the URL called units, equals and pass this string and the way to do it this is a request parameter <coughs> and if you remember in the urls we have to put a question mark and then is it units or unit units and then we put units auto then let's restart this remove the first breakpoint yeah now Data currently, apparent, yeah, apparent temperature 10.63. How did you measure that 0.63? Come on, this is, you know, yeah. <laughs> that's weird. Um, all right, but where was it again? Data dot currently dot temperature or apparent temperature. I guess this is what it feel like, felt like. Um, and there is also the summary. So let's make a nice string out of this. I want the name of the city, um, the weather condition, the summary, and then the, the temperature. So I can do something like, first the city name, IP, um, sorry, it's press.data.city, I guess, we'll see. Press, data, city, that's right, London, is currently weatherrest.data.currently.summary. So it's currently partly cloudy. And weatherrest.data. Currently, the temperature degrees. Yeah. So let's restart this and run it completely and see what it will give us. London is currently partly cloudy and 10.61 degrees. That's cool. The last one is weather as data currently temperature. Yeah. So it's nice, right? I made use of an external library that gives me my IP address. I took that information and then learned where I am actually, latitude and longitude. And I took that information and gave it to the weather API to see what the weather is like. Of course, you also saw that there is the, yeah, it's not here, but you also saw that there is the forecast. So let's see if we can get the weather information for another day. So data daily, excuse me, eight days. So five days from now on, I guess, the maximum temperature will be 13 degrees, maybe. And 
it's gonna rain at night so maybe it's okay to deliver the scooter then because hopefully during the day there won't be any rain and the customer can ride their scooter after they receive it yeah so this is kind of all you need to do to make use of external apis you find an api you search through its documentation and you learn how to use it and then you um, basically get the result that you want that they get so There is one more API that I want to show you, and that is the API of Oxford dictionaries. Actually, you have a whole dictionary at your fingertips, and um, you can make use of that. Now, I want to ask you to sign up for it. I already did, and you can do it afterwards. Because basically, it's the same steps. You just fill a form, click a button in your email, and then you um, get the, uh, the address. Um, so it's developer.oxforddictionaries.com it gives you an app key um, the secret key again and an app ID and making use of the API you see this is Pretty much well documented. It says if you don't use the correct secret key and app ID, you'll get something that started 403. The authentication failed error. <coughs> so let's try to implement something with this thing. Uh, um. The worst side of this API documentation is I don't know where the the requests are. Making a request to the API. Yeah. <laughs> References. Learn about our data. See what you can do. Anything? Can I do anything with your data? Oh, this is killing me. <laughs> anyway, could anybody find anything? Hmm? What? Yeah, we were there. It doesn't give us anything, just tells about filtering. API credentials. Yeah, we have the API here. Um, on the home page, on the doc of the documentation, why didn't I? Why is it not here? What? Ah. The page is still loading. Yes. See? <laughs> Didn't finish. That's great. Anyway, I already know what it will give us. Um, yeah. All right. Perfect. Dictionary entries. So you can actually get.
very detailed results about any word that you want. You know, it can tell you, um, for example, let's try ace. It can tell you the meaning and gives you the, you know, where it comes from in its etymology, its roots, the definition, and, you know, the common terms that you're using that you should be using that word in. Anyway, so how do we make use of this data? So they have this request URL, all right? I take this. Let's maybe comment these out. Axios.get and I run this. Let's do console log rest.data. All right. And it crashed again with 403. Why? Because I didn't pass in the FID and app secret, right? So now you see here, it talks about using some request headers. It says you should be passing these as your HTTP headers, um, the app ID and the app key to make use of the API. And basically that's what we're gonna do. We basically will take this and um, put these in the, in the headers of, of our request. <coughs> I guess it's something like this. I'm not sure. But we should be passing an object called headers. And it has app ID and app key. Yeah. Now, these values look realistic because they are real. The documentation is really nice. They basically embedded our FID and F key in their documentation so that we can just copy and paste. So that's a good thing. Let's try if this will work. Didn't. Oh, the URL must be a string. Receive type object. Is it not the URL? It is the URL. Oh, it's axios.request. That's okay. Anyway. Yeah. So we have a result. Let's run this again. I want to show you the data. Results zero. See, we're looking for the word ace. Lexical entries. There are three entries for ace. The first one is a noun. There are two entries for that. Three senses of the word. The first sense has one definition in one domain, the cards domain. And two examples, that definition is a playing card with a single spot, blah, blah. Short definition, playing card with a single spot. That's not short, you're just missing two characters. Examples. Life had started dealing with an ace or the ace of diamonds. So this is a very extensive dictionary data that you can get for free. Um, but the reason we did this example is some APIs demand you to pass in some request headers with every request that you're doing to the API to pass in the FID and the F key, okay? And this is tedious. 
if you have to copy and paste this to every request, it just won't work, right? It's not a good idea. So Axios has another way of doing this, another way of achieving the same result so that we can easily deal with the APIs. And it is by creating an instance of Axios that's pre-configured to have these values. So we will tell it, hey Axios, give me something that I can use, which already has the app key and the app ID and the first part of the URL in, so that I don't have to type those all the time, all right? And that's called agent. <coughs> it's done by using axios.create and we pass in an object. So the first thing is the base URL. And it's basically the first part of the URL that I don't want to repeat, which is this part. So I take this, put it in the base URL, so that it, this at the bottom will work. And I also want to put in the headers. So I take this here, there. Um, then it will be as simple as this. I run it again. Oh. The response has the data that I need. All right. The data is very convoluted. It's very hard to get this. It's rest.data.results, square brackets zero, dot lex entries, like results, square bracket zero, dot lexical entries, zero, dot entries, zero, dot census, zero, dot something. It's going on and on and it's a huge data. But this is the idea of using Axios agents for us um, to make use of you know centralized configuration. And this API key and API ID of course shouldn't be in your code. Don't um, commit and push this to GitHub because it will be public. There are a lot of public keys that are supposed to be private and secret on GitHub. There are a lot of passwords, database passwords on GitHub. You can search for DB password and you'll get all of them. The search is also public. So do not repeat this mistake. What you should do is you should use a, an environment variable uh, and pass these as your environment variables um, so that they can be configured in your server environment. It's, it, will be, it will look something like this. Process dot process dot env dot fid process dot env dot app key and when you're running your application you do app id equals blah blah app key equals something else and node index.js all right Let's actually do that. Let's see that it works. FID is this, F key is this. Yeah, see, we get the result. Let's type a wrong application key. We get the error, so it works. This is how you should pass your configuration. Yeah. Yeah. You can reuse this agent for any query that you want. So you can, you know, you create this only once. 
and then it even doesn't have to live there. You create this in another file uh, when you first launch your application, and then by using that during the lifetime of your application, you can make as many requests as you want. Yeah. No. If they have an API like this, yes, but normally no. Oxford had the API, so we could basically do that. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So there is one last thing that I want to talk about um, for APIs, and that is there is a simpler way of doing this. You don't have to use Axios, and you don't have to use the REST API all the time because some developers or some companies are really nice, and then they give us something called libraries. There are pretty much libraries for any language out there for most of the APIs, and you can make use of those. Now, Dark Sky actually has several libraries, and it's most of the time it's not the original developers of the API, but some random open source contributors that are doing these APIs, these wrapper libraries around the APIs. So let's say I want to use Dark Sky, right? Or I want to see if Dark Sky has a library for Node.js. I type Dark Sky npm. I think that's enough. Yeah, the first result, the first three results are, you know, three different Dark Sky APIs. So <laughs> the open source contributors, you know, one of them didn't like the work of the other. The third one didn't like the work of the first two. So there are three different npm packages for dealing with the dark sky api which we use for weather forecast so let's use this one dark dash sky um, this is its documentation and here's a usage example so let's directly copy and paste this okay yeah uh, yeah. Yeah. It's so simple to try out. You copy and paste, see if it works. And if it doesn't work, you then look into further documentation. Yeah, of course. I, yeah, the first one is that it should work because the first goal that you have is to you know provide something that works for the customer, and then you'll look into whether it performs okay. Uh, if you're working in an enterprise, some sometimes they prevent you from using third-party libraries. So you have to go to the source code of this library and prove that it's okay. Um, and for every update to this library, there are procedures that require you to, you know, sign that, yeah, I, I looked into the new version of the library. Um, I say, I guarantee that it's okay to use, that it's, it doesn't have any bugs or um, security breaches. And then you can deploy the newer version of the library. Um, but this practice is only done in Cisco and, you know, companies at that level. Um, most of the other people, like even Apple, actually don't really care that much about Node.js packages. Um, but, you know, if you want to go crazy, you can definitely do so. But normally what we do is we just take this. If it works, that's fine. Um, if you want to customize it, most of the time we do want to customize it. Then we fork this and make use of our own libraries. It's also a little bit easier because they can delete their GitHub repository. They, can, they can't they can delete their NPM package, but still it's good to for it to live in a namespace that we own, like, for example, the name of your company, um, your GitHub account. So you fork it, 
you make changes or you fix some bugs, you don't wait for the original developer to fix that. Um, if there are performance problems, you look into alternatives. Um, if there are no performance problems, it's okay, you just use it. Yeah, there are like 700,000 libraries, packages on NPM. So there's, you know, one for everything or three in this case for Dark Sky. So it's always good to, to look into NPM. Um, you can put it in your shell file. It basically differs, but there's you know something called bash rc, or in my case it's zsh rc. Um, I will not get that because it really holds secret keys. Uh, but um, if you put that there, probably it will like on every terminal that you run those. Uh, Environment variables will be already set in. Um, yeah. Or you can, yeah. Yeah. So you have the versions here, and what we do is you check when the last version was basically released. If it's you know three years ago, and um, in the last seven days there are like one hundred and thirty people, maybe you don't want to use that library because it's not maintained anymore. Or you basically take that risk if you want to use that library. Um, you take the risk of maintaining it because Node.js version will increase um, next year. So maybe the library will break because some things will change in the language or in Node.js. So uh, basically these are the criteria when you um, define you know, what is passable or what is okay for you to use as a library. Um, but since this is an example, it's, it's all right. Like most of these public APIs have libraries, even if they're like four years old, they most of the time work. So your millage may vary. Like if this is a very business critical thing for your use case, of course you want to make sure that the latest version is you know up to date and maybe it's fresh, it's like three months old at the latest, and there's a huge community of developers supporting it or a huge community of users using it so that you can find questions on Stack Overflow about that library um, or in the GitHub issues and stuff. So it's really important. Um, how often that library is used or maintained. Um, but if it's not something that critical like this thing, this application, you know, it's okay if it just works. Um, so let's make use of this library. This is how we install it. npm install dark sky. <coughs> and we had the example in the readme. And this is the last example, then we'll take a short break. Yeah, see this is basically used the, this used the process environment there for the key, dark sky. So let's go here, paste this here. Um, our key was here. I'm gonna just replace it because I don't wanna deal with environment variables right now. New dark sky, see this is a different approach. Previously, we were doing this. Now, we're gonna do the example here. What is this? <laughs> so wrong. I'm gonna delete these. Okay. Anyway, so dark sky, latitude, longitude, time, units. Let's use auto. 
here. And let's also fix the latitude and longitude. Because here, rest.data.latitude. Rest data latitude. Rest data longitude. The time, I don't need it. Language, I don't need. Yeah. All right. And then console.log. Hopefully, if I run this, it will work. But I need to see something in the console. Yeah. So it gave me the object in the console. But again, this is using promises, right? We have the then here. How do we convert it into async await? It's like a pop quiz. We did this in the beginning, right? We converted the promises into async await, yeah. Call this better. Rest maybe equals of eight. Yeah, and that's it, right? Um, now let's try if this thing will work here. I just moved the the previous console log down, so I think we can remove these, but I'm not sure. Let's try. I put a breakpoint here because I don't know what the API response will be. Weather rest currently, yeah. So when I run this, I see London is currently part of cloudy and 9.78 degrees. It fell by 0. Point, what, 95? Um, 85, so it's getting colder. But basically, this is how we make use of a library that wraps an external API, okay? And this library required me to pass in the, the API key here and instantiate a new instance of this class called Dark Sky. All the libraries are different. So you'll find them, they require a config object that asks you to give the app ID, app key, I don't know, um, some work with environment variables, so you don't need to pass in anything. Some, you don't even need to instantiate anything, you can directly call them. It depends on the library. But basically this is as, as simple as it gets to make use of external requests. Sorry? Yeah. That's a um, breakpoint, but if you remove that, you know it will just run and give you the the output. Um, there are two topics that I want to talk about next. Maybe in the next hour or next week we're gonna do that. Uh, one is how do you make use of um, a cache layer? because you can only make 1,000 requests to this API, for example, for free. So you want to cache some of the requests so that you don't do them over and over again, you record them into a database. And the second is how do you do parallel requests because you're using await and it will block the request. <coughs> so this will always do one after the other. What, if, what happens if you get you know, five cities, if you want to get five cities in parallel from the API, do you wait until the first request is over and then you do the second request. That's what happens in this case. Um, so that parallelization of async and await is not a topic of this. We had covered it last year, but um, I'm also gonna talk about that hopefully either in the second hour or next week, hopefully next week. And that's all. So what are you gonna do? In the remaining hour after the break, um, I ask you to go to the links here, the API aggregators, let's say. Um, 
there's an API for everything. Just browse, pick something that you want to use, and make an application. You know, pick two APIs that would make sense to bridge together, like the IP API, um, the weather API, the location API, or the dictionary. Bring them together and, you know, make something that works. And we'll be here to help you. There's everything, you know, MBA stats, lyrics, artists, albums. Um, even for XKCD, there's an API. So you can probably get the URL of a comic of the last comic 